Jane Twangy, I've always been such a fan of yours. And now you have a new book out called Generations. This follows Generation Me and iGen, as well as a number of articles about generational trends. What got you interested in studying generations in the first place? So I was an undergraduate, you know, working on my college honors thesis, and I was interested in gender. And so I gave a big questionnaire to some of my fellow students and noticed that the women in particular scored very differently there in the early 90s than the 1970s test manual said they were supposed to. And I realized, you know, that might be a generational difference. Do you worry that the field of generational research can sometimes lend itself to too many generalizations? That's always something you have to deal with when you're looking at any kind of group difference. Differences, whether you're grouping people by age or by culture or by gender, you always have to give that caveat that, yes, we're looking at the average and there's going to be plenty of variation within the group. But you can still find some very interesting differences that might help us all understand each other better. And that's my goal. Jean, I can't help but remember Paul Lynn singing What's the Matter with Kids Today and Bye Bye Birdie. Is it the tendency of every generation to criticize or be perplexed by the generation that follows? I think so, because we're always trying to figure out that younger generation because they grew up in a different world. But younger generations also criticize older ones. Uh, I think one of the best ways to get around that problem is to really go straight to the source and to ask particularly young people themselves, you know, how they spend their time, how they're feeling and what's important to them. And then to compare that over time. So that's what I've done in the book. It's based on 39 million people filled out surveys, you know, some of which go back to the 1940s. And we're in the age of big data. You know, that's a great thing. We don't have to rely on, say, the observations of, of people like older people looking at younger people. We, we can see what people have to say for themselves. When you talk about 39 million people, how do you make sure that group is representative? Because obviously there are people who live in different parts of the world. There are people who make, you know, dra- dramatically different salaries. There are people with huge cultural uh, differences. So how do you ensure that your data is truly representative? Yeah, so most of what I'm looking at here is within the United States. There's some good international data. There's, of course, going to be some differences around the world. The great news is that data from the U.S. is almost all nationally representative. So whether that's polls or government-funded surveys, they get a cross-section of people from across the country of every background. And that's what's wonderful about it, is we know we're not looking at just one small pocket of people who aren't representative. It's everyone. Let's talk about the factors that shape various generations. I know there was a theory for some time that big world events often shape generations. For example, like the Vietnam War for baby boomers or 9-11 for millennials or COVID and the pandemic for Gen Z. Tell me about that theory and if that still holds. So that is the traditional theory that major events have the biggest impact on generations. So not just the event, but how old you are when you experience it. And that does have some effect on people. But what has a bigger effect on day to day life, especially long term, is technology. So it's technology that makes what living now so completely different from what it was like to live 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 20 years ago. And when I say technology, of course, you know, I'm including the internet and smartphones and social media, but it goes beyond that, to things like airplanes and air conditioning and better uh, medical care and labor-saving devices like washing machines. That's always the one I came back to when I was writing the book and thinking, you know, if I had been a woman in the 1800s instead of now, how my life would be completely unrecognizable and mostly because of technology. And of course, you think about the automobile and how different our lives would be if that form of transportation had never been invented. And then you look at the future and you look at driverless cars and how that might again shift an entire generation. Yeah, all of these technologies just have these downstream effects, whether that's on how we spend our time. They can also have an influence on our attitudes and our values and our life course. So that was the other thing 
thing that I explored was that you have more technology, you generally have more individualism, so more focus on the self and less on others. Uh, this is a system where you have a lot of um, emphasis on equality, for example. And then you also get the life course slowing down from infancy to old age, that kids are less independent and teenagers uh, are not as likely to get their driver's license or to have a paid job or to go out on dates. Young adults take longer to marry and have kids and settle into careers. And then later in life, people are middle-aged and older, look at themselves and think, man, I look and act so much younger than my parents or my grandparents did at the same age. And when people talk about, you know, 60 is the new 50, it, it really is true. They've actually looked at this in medical studies, aging markers are lower now in 60 year olds than they were uh, 30 years ago. And this is because we live longer. So we take longer at each stage of the life class, uh, life course. Let's talk about the boomers because I am one of them. I was born in 1957. So I'm a little bit towards the end of boomers, right? Boomers are what, 1946? To 1964. To 1964. So what characterizes my generation in terms of their changes in attitudes and lifestyle? Yeah. So you think about where boomers are in history and the generation before them, the silence, they were the leaders of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement, but it was boomers who really lived those changes. That, the I mean, silence I'm, are people born between what years? 1925 and 1945. So they're the generation right before the boomers that are often forgotten. But some of the things that are associated with boomers are, are actually silence. Um, but yeah, it was the boomers who really lived that uh, new world, especially in terms of the quality uh, across um, race and gender and sexual orientation and changed hearts and minds, you know, around that. I think the silence changed the laws and, and boomers changed the culture. But do you think that's really true when you think about marriage equality, Jean? I'm, that didn't come to pass until when? Was that 2016 or? 2015. 2015. Mm -hmm. So can the boomers really take credit for that? Well, so it was a, it was a, a Gen Xer um, who was the, the name plaintiff. Uh, and mo most of the, the folks in, in, involved in that were, were Gen Xers. So I think that, you know, that's a, it's a multi-generational effort. And when you look at attitudes, it's really millennials that stand out and support, you know, for LGBT rights. So that's something where, you know, it was a multi-generational effort. Tell me more, more about boomers. What shaped them in particular? Well, there were a, a lot of things. So first is simply from the name that boomers are a very, very large generation and they managed to really dominate the culture at every stage because of their sheer size. So the, the country was very child focused in the 50s when they were kids, then had the teenage rebellion stage, so to speak, in the, the late 60s, early 70s. Then in the 80s, shifted toward careers and family, just as many boomers were. Uh, and I think we're, we're now seeing lots and lots of, of boomers still in leadership, and no one's exactly sure what this country is going to look like with when boomers start retiring at a faster rate because they've dominated the culture for so long. Or when they start dying, I hate to say, right? Yeah, and that's the speculation on that. And because people live longer, that is 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 you know been pushed off. So one thing that I looked at um, is say governorships and the U.S. Senate, where Gen Xers have been senators and governors at a much lower rate than Boomers were in when they were the folks who were middle aged, uh, say in their forties and fifties. So because not just because of its size, but because of longer life. Boomers are holding on to power a little bit longer. But I always want to say at this point, there is this perception that boomers are all rich and powerful. And that, that that's really, really untrue, <clears throat> especially if you look at boomers who did not get a college education. Real huge problems financially. Uh, and then kind of across the board, the deaths of despair that a lot of the economists have documented. This is not a generation that is uniformly successful. Uh, or you know, uniformly, you know, enjoying being, you know, leaders. There's there's some huge issues as well 
In fact, you say boomers' death rates in middle age are considerably higher than in previous generations, mostly due to drug overdoses and suicide. And that's the deaths of, of despair that you're referring to, which I think were often the result of a changing economy, correct? Yeah. So, you know, there's this really common narrative that boomers, you know, were very financially successful and they climbed that ladder and then they pulled up the ladder uh, after them bef before, you know, to keep younger generations from, from climbing it. And it's really a false narrative. You know, boomers were really the first victims of the changing economy, not the perpetrators, because the economy really shifted, say, in the 80s, away from manufacturing towards service jobs. And boomers, particularly those without a college degree, really got caught in that change because they may have in, say, the 70s, gotten a factory, factory job at 18 or a job at a steel mill. And then those jobs went away. And it was very late for them to try to find another way to make a living. So there's really, I think, a, a misperception of um, the financial status of, of boomers and how that generational play really went. What was the pre prevailing technology that really changed things for boomers, Gene, and defined that generation? So boomers were really, they were the first to grow up with television. And that, you know, had had a big impact in a lot of different ways ways. So you know, one thing that I focus on, especially as a psychologist, is thinking about um, self-expression and pe people being just more willing to talk about things. And that really goes hand in hand with the age of television. So one example I use in the book is Oprah. So she's a great example of someone who, if she had been born 50 years before, would not have had the life trajectory that, that she had. Um, and that's partially about equality and race, but it's also that her style, I think, is just quintessential boomer of let's all share together and let's talk together. And that was something the science generation, especially the greatest generation before that, those who fought World War II, the boomers' parents, that was really not how they did things. So that was a big shift. I would venture to guess that Oprah wouldn't have the same trajectory had she been born 50 years later, either, given the fragmentation mm -hmm. of the media landscape. Yeah, I think you're right. And so, you know, that that's something I think about a lot um, as a Gen Xer, that I feel like we were the last generation to have a unified pop culture and media experience, um, because after that, then, you know, we were the last ones to grow up with three channels on TV, and then it all became much more atomized, and then you go online, and, you know, kids will talk about the, t the popular TikTok video, but maybe you know, it's not as common or as universal an experience. It's more dictated to the individual's taste. When it comes to technology and boomers, I can't help but wonder about the birth control pill. Didn't mm -hmm. that change so much for women? Yeah, it, it did. Absolutely. So that's another example of a technology that had, you know, really big downstream effects. So, you know, there's a, just a lot of these technologies um, are, are one of the many of these you know, are really the reason why women have been able to participate so much more in careers. So birth control is one example as labor saving devices like washing machines are another one that really, really changed the, the whole life trajectory for so many women. What about some of the historical events though, Jean, like the Vietnam War and Richard Nixon's resignation and Watergate? Didn't that have a big impact on boomers? I mean, I think I think it did, but I think it's also interwoven with a lot of these other, you know, big cultural shifts in values, like individualism being the biggest example of you know, more more focused on the self, less on social rules. So you combine that with Vietnam and you get a lot of the protests and people not wanting to be drafted. Because what I think is interesting about Vietnam is the silent generation didn't protest Korea, being drafted to Korea, and, and the greatest generation didn't protest being drafted to World War II. Now, there's three different conflicts, but Vietnam and Korea are somewhat similar. People, people could justify World War II, and right. I think in many ways, the Korean War, much more than our involvement in Vietnam could be justified, though. So do you think that's really an apt comparison? You know, that's a good question. Um, I, 
obviously, you know, I'm not a war historian. It's it's a little hard to exactly take a position on this, but I think Korea and Vietnam certainly have some similarities in t- in terms of uh, you know what we were doing there. Uh, it was you know the hot part of the Cold War, and that was really not protested in Vietnam was. And I think it was because, partially because of that generational shift rooted in individualism, because the military draft is very anti-individualistic. Do you think that this adherence to individualism may be responsible for these much older people clinging to power and not stepping aside so a younger generation or even a middle-aged generation can take their place? I think that's really tied to that that slow life strategy, that change in the life course that we get with better medical care and longer lives, that as people are living longer and they're healthier longer, that, and this is exactly what we've gotten, not just with the presidency, but in the U.S. Senate, is the average age keeps going up, but it's at base for a good reason that we live longer. Let's talk about retirement and boomers. Do boomers generally want to keep working until they have to be taken out of their offices or their workplaces in a body bag? Or are they anxious to retire and enjoy their lives? Not yeah, that know, we, working doesn't mean you're not enjoying your life. So, Right. Yeah. I mean, there's there's some of both. I mean, if, if you look at like one of the big surveys I work with is of high school school seniors. And there's a bunch of questions on uh, work being a central part of your life. Well, for the boomers in that sample, so those who were high school students in the 1970s, that's that was the peak. So it's really there's there is that that strong work ethic among boomers. And I think that that is showing up. Um, and if they're healthier for longer, that plays a role. But I think that is starting to change. So there's some data to suggest that the great resignation, which we saw the last few years, was often driven by boomers retiring earlier, at least a little bit early. So I think we're really in a stage right now in the workplace with that transition happening with with more and more boomers retiring. It's one of the reasons we have still a labor shortage across a lot of different fields. Let's talk about work attitudes of boomers versus millennials and Gen Z, because you hear a lot of conversation and there's a lot of tension about that in workplaces, I think, all across the country. Can you talk about that and the whole notion of the entitled millennial and now trying to figure out Gen Z and why there's so much conflict, it seems? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think generation gaps right now are larger than they've been since the late 60s. They're, it's partially around different communication streams that, you know, you have the boomer wants to see you face to face, the Gen Xer wants to email you, the millennial wants to text you, and Gen Z wants to send you a TikTok video. Now, of course, <laughs> it's very generalized, and it's not completely true, but we do have these gaps now. And there, there is, you know, you know, a lot of discussion of these things, um, and also around free speech and cancel culture. It's another thing where there's a pretty, pretty big generational break, often with boomers and Gen Xers on one side and millennials and Gen Z on the other. A lot of corporate conflicts over the last uh, five to ten years. That's the way that they that they have broken. Um, I think there, there, there is some some really good news. Um, Gen Z is more likely even than boomers um, to say that they want to help others. They want a job where they can help others. So I think that's a really big opportunity. Um, a lot of those questions on work ethic were better for Gen Z. They kind of had improved, you know, among 18 year olds. But that changed in 2021. Then it went way down. So we still have to see if that's a blip. But it did kind of coincide with some of those ideas around quiet quitting. So I'm not so sure where that piece is going to go. Well, explain that the difference in work ethic between baby boomers and people of my generation who honestly live to work and millennials and Gen Z workers who seem to work to live and to really care about work-life balance. I'm not saying one generation has it right and one generation has it wrong, but how can you explain the difference in attitudes toward careers? Yeah. So there, there is a difference. I mean, that's the, the first thing. And, and it's sometimes perceived that maybe that's based on age, you know, being older versus younger. 
but we've got the data from these big surveys comparing people at the same age, at age 18. And that does still show up that boomers more likely to say work is a central part of life, more likely to say they're willing to work overtime, things like that. Um, and yeah, we had that turnaround for a little bit and just didn't stick. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a great question to ask, you know, why, why did that happen? And I think we don't entirely know. But there's a number of things going on. Income inequality is probably in that equation. Um, I think there's a lot of negativity right now, especially for young people. There's, uh, for a bunch of reasons, based on kind of kind of a toxic online culture and a lot of other influences, that there's this very strong tendency to say, you know, oh, things are unfair and, you know, why work hard? It's not going to do any good anyway. That's called an external locus of control in psychology. And it it's that's something we have to be concerned about because that type of attitude doesn't usually lead to good outcomes. What are some other reasons that, for example, you know, boundaries are being drawn? And again, this might be healthy for younger people and my willing to work 24-7 whenever I was needed. Um, I think it resulted in a lot of professional success for me, but why do you think such boundaries are being drawn? And, you know, there's, I think a lot of it is because now we're constantly connected in a way that I wasn't when I was younger and people can reach you 24 seven. And when I went home, I was home. Right. And when I was off, I was off. And perhaps it's a, it's a reaction to the connectivity that for better or for worse exists today. Do you think that's behind it? It's certainly part of it that you have to set more of those boundaries because you can be constantly reached. So in other words, if you want to get sleep at night, then you have to set those boundaries. And you know that that and having time for family and all of those things, I mean, it really does show you how, yeah, this this is when you have to you do have to take a step back and realize, okay, certainly there's some downside sides to saying, no, I don't want to work overtime. But think about that for a minute. That also means you can spend more time with family. You can get a good night's sleep and maybe you'll be a better worker during the hours you work if you have had that time to be with the people you love, if you have had that time for self-care. So that's one of the phrases that I think, uh, you know, millennials and Gen Z uh, coined or at least popularized. And they have an excellent point that we do need to have that balance and we do need to have some of those boundaries. And do you think it is ever swung too far because of course the rap on millennials for so long was they were entitled. And I think about your previous books and how they grew up and iGen and Generation Me and some of Lori Gottlieb's work talking about helicopter parenting. Has that had a long-term impact on millennials and for that matter, Gen Z's as well? Yeah, it's interesting to look at the trajectory of some of these things. So um, I had found before that, um, so narcissism, which is, that includes entitlement, that that had increased among college students between the early 80s and um, the mid 2000s, so around 2007. But then things turned around with the Great Recession and then with more ubiquitous social media, it actually went down. So it's a curve. Um, so the biggest issue today is depression. That's that's the, the adolescent mental health crisis is by far, I think, the biggest problem that is facing Gen Z because it's not just adolescents anymore. It's also young adults who are much more likely to be clinically depressed now than, say, 10 years ago. And that has all these downstream effects, too. Um, and even if we don't think about that, it's, this is a huge, huge problem that we have twice as many young adults, twice as many teens who are depressed. And the numbers are really scary, aren't they? Not only depressed, but the number of teenagers, particularly teenage girls who have taken their own lives or have, have attempted uh, suicide or have had suicidal ideation, those numbers have skyrocketed, haven't they? Yeah. So the CDC data came out on that recently, that um, big, big increases in um, teens thinking about suicide. 
And it's not just what teens are saying. It's also emergency room visits for self-harm and emergency room visits for suicide attempts have, have doubled or tripled um, since 2010. So it's not just about, say, reporting symptoms, it's behaviors too. So these are really, really serious issues. And when you think about the cause of these issues, do you, you look squarely at social media, Gene? I do think social media and smartphones are, are one of the primary causes. So these changes started to show up in these big surveys around 2011 or 2012. And teen depression doubled between 2011 and 2019. So even before the pandemic, there's a lot of focus right now saying, oh, it's because of the pandemic. No, it started a long time ago. And the end of 2012, that's the first time that the majority of Americans owned a smartphone. It's also around the same time that social media became much more ubiquitous in high schools. Just a few years before that, only about half of teens said they use social media every day. And then by 2017, it was 85%. So it crosses that tipping point where if you don't use it, you're left out. And then if you do use it, there's all of the pressures of social media and that it takes away time. Because that's the other thing that happened. Teens started spending a lot more time online with their friends. And, uh, and doing other things. And then they started spending less time with their friends face to face. And that is not a good formula for mental health. Being alone in your bedroom, scrolling through Instagram, compared with actually being in the same place with your friends and, and talking. Well, sometimes when teenagers are in the same place with their friends, they're all on their phones. Right. So even when they do get together face to face, then the technology can interfere with that. And there's been some really fascinating studies too that showed uh, had a group of young adults go out to dinner and they could either have access to their phones or not. And those who had access to their phones said that the dinner was less enjoyable. Really? Yeah. And I sometimes go to restaurants and I'll look at a table of six people and they're all on their phones around the table. And it's so crazy to me, but it's not that unusual a sight. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I think that's one of those again, pieces of the kind of always on culture, but you know, we don't have to give up our phones. Our phones are awesome. They can do so many great things for us. It's just, there's certain times and places when it's better to put them away. And even teens agree to that. That's the other thing that's interesting. You know, since my, my previous book, iGen came out, I've spoken at a lot of high schools, even middle schools and talked to a lot of kids and they'll say, you know, we don't want anybody to take away our phones, but having a break from them. Great. Because we, we don't we know that this isn't having a great effect on us. We just don't know what to do about it. Well, the problem is it's addictive, right? And it's designed to be addictive. Yeah, social media in particular, they pour millions, probably billions into those apps and the algorithms to make people coming back, you know, to make them come back as many times as possible for as long as possible, because that's how the companies make the most money. And Think about that as an adult, you know, any adult who has had social media recognizes that, you know, compulsive kind of obsessive feeling, even if you don't call it addiction, you know, there's clearly something going on there. And then think about being 12 and then how that is just next level for being so sticky and so hard to put down. And that dopamine rush you get uh, when you get positive reinforcement of any kind on the phone. Mm -hmm. In addition to social media though, what are some of the other things that are resulting in unprecedented levels of anxiety and depression among not only Gen Z, but polars, as you call those who were born after 2010? Yeah, so I, I call them polars after the melting polar ice caps and political polarization. So two things that are big issues right now and will continue to be probably in the future. Um, so for them, it's not as much social media because these are kids who are pretty young, but they're exercising less and obesity rates for children are th through the roof. And so I think it's pretty clear there that this is probably connected to technology as well. The kids are not running around outside as much as they used to. They're not having the same type of childhood. And so, yeah, it's not just teenagers we have to think about with this. It's also what effect is it having on kids? There's also sort of that thing that happened, I guess, in the 90s with stranger danger, right? Where I used to get on my bike in the morning and come back at 530 at night with my friends. 
And now parents are understandably much more protective about where their kids go. Yeah, this is the interesting thing. So this is part of the slow life strategy of kids being less independent. But, you know, there's other things going on here, you know, media influences, things like that. Because the, the irony is there's less violent crime now than there was 30 years ago. So in that way, kids are actually safer. And we have some data to back that up, too. They're less likely to get into fistfights or car accidents, you know, childhood death rates you know, until very recently, you know, we're going down. So kids are actually physically safer, but they are more constrained. There's been this big cultural shift toward protecting kids, which has done a lot of good. We've had mission creep, so we're not just protecting them from physical harm. We're also protecting them from experiences. And that's obviously not as good. So they're not getting as much experience being independent or making decisions. And then they get to college and they don't know what to do with themselves because, and that's, I mean, it's hard. I'm trying to say that from a place of empathy, not a place of criticism, that this is just the way the culture has changed, just the way the generation has grown up. And that's a tough position to be in. If you have not gone out of the house without your parents all that much, or never had a driver's license or a job, and then you go off to college and you're trying to do all these things on your own. Let me ask you a few more questions about Gen Z because I'm fascinated by that generation. Let me give a few statistics that you point out in your book. More Gen Zs are more likely than older generation to say there are more than two genders. More than 5% Gen Zers are transgender or non-binary. 20 times more Gen Zers identify as transgender than boomers. Four times more young adults identified as transgender in 2021 than in 2014. So I'm curious because I th think a lot of people ask the question, is, 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 are there more transgender people now than there ever were? Or is it just safer to talk about being transgender? And I wonder what your research found. Yeah, so that that was that's a great question, and you know I think we really we really don't know. Um, these these changes have happened pretty recently. A lot of that increase um, happened just between 2020 and 2021, and that is certainly one theory. Of there's so much more acceptance now for transgender people that that might be why people are more willing to, on an anonymous survey, say that they're transgender. But, you know, it is an anonymous survey. Uh, the, these are surveys that are done often by the CDC, and they're, there's all the assurances that they're anonymous. And a lot of the other questions are about things. You know, it's a risk survey. They're asked about alcohol use and drug use and all kinds of other sensitive topics as well. The other piece that I kind of stumble on in thinking about is if it's just acceptance, then why wouldn't there be changes for older adults as well over that 2014 to 2020 time period when there was a you know, big shift um, in the national um, conversation around this? And there really weren't. The change is almost exclusively for people ages um, 18 to 26. Those 27 and older, transgender identification hardly changed at all. So what do you think happened? How did it become... Uh, a much more commonplace thing? And how did attitude shift so quickly? Yeah. And again, I think, you know, we, we really don't know. Um, I mean, one, one thing that was an interesting piece of the puzzle was that the shift in uh, identifying as transgender for young adults was almost exactly the same in conservative red states as in liberal blue states. So that suggests whatever is happening, it's national and not just regional. Do you think technology has played a role in it in terms of social media giving people more exposure and more of a community? That That's one theory. You know, many people have talked about that, that it's easier for people to, to find a community and to find um, information online. And maybe that's something that hasn't happened as much for older people, or maybe older people um, may say identify that way, but but it's harder to change your whole life and change your gender identity when you're older. So these are all possibilities. And I think we just, we just don't know which one is correct yet. You also point out that out of uh, one out of five Gen Z women identifies as bisexual, much higher than in previous generations. 
and the number of high school students identifying as lesbian, gay, or bisexual nearly doubled between 2015 and 2021. What's, what's behind those numbers? Yeah, it's, it's the same, same type of story where we're not exactly sure. Certainly greater acceptance is is playing a role here and it's it's particularly interesting that most of that change is in identifying as bisexual particularly uh, young women identifying as bisexuals where by far the most change has happened so it might very well be that you know 30 years ago that was particularly acceptable and it's now more acceptable and people are more overt about you know, the, the behavior might have been going on before, but people were not necessarily as upfront or they were more secretive about it because of societal norms and expectations. Yeah, that's absolutely a possibility. Let me ask you about this statistic. Nearly a third of men between the ages of 18 to 20 and 25 did not have sex in the last year. That surprised me. What's going on with um, what's going on with sex in Gen Z's? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And this started with millennials that, you know, you'd think we're in a time when say premarital sex is more acceptable than ever that, you know, a lot, there's a lot of sexualized media, all of this kind of stuff. People are much more open, uh, you know, about discussing it. You know, there's some really positive developments here, but we also have a different atmosphere that there's so much emphasis on, on dating apps that there's so much um, exposure to pornography that we do have this slow life strategy where 18 is not what it used to be. And, you know, more younger people who are not as independent. And I think all of these things are, are, are playing a role, uh, even though, again, like some of the other things, we're not exactly sure why it's happening and still trying to figure it out. Yeah, I wondered if more conversation about sexual assault has also had an impact on some of these young men in terms of uh, wanting to be more respectful or wanting to not get in a situation where there's a he said, she said thing going on. Yeah, it could, it could be. It could be more, more caution, uh, more emphasis on safety. That's certainly something that comes up a lot with, with Gen Z. And then um, I talked to a couple of people who pointed out, well, you know, maybe it's that people are just, they're, they're waiting or they, they may not want to have as much sex with as many people and may be placing more of a premium on when they do have sex. So uh, maybe they, maybe that it's better sex. I thought that was an interesting perspective. You found out that Gen Zers are more likely to support the restriction of speech. We see this playing out on college campuses and probably at some high schools as well. Uh, more conservatives bemoaning the fact that there can't be a free exchange of ideas because of fear of cancel culture and then other people saying that we have to be inclusive and sensitive. And so I think both sides have their motivations, but how do you see that playing out and where did that come from? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. The um, political views around free speech have flipped. So it used to be liberals, those on the left, who were much more supportive of free speech, even around issues that were important to them, like say race or discrimination. So the ACLU, we associate with being a fairly liberal organization, but they historically have defended free speech rights, even for you know the classic example of the neo-Nazis marching in Skokie, Illinois, where there's a large Jewish population. That was the ACLU. It was the idea of you know really, really broad free speech rights. And then what happens is it 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 flipped around. And it used to be the liberals are more supportive of, of broad free speech, and now it's conservatives. So, and that that's also a generational thing is what I found out that that shift has been more pronounced for millennials and Gen Z because you're right that's what shows up in the survey data is that those generations just more likely to say there should be restrictions on speech. And it, it started on college campuses. It's now moved outward um, to the national conversation and to corporations and so on. 
Um, and I think this this has created a lot of generational conflict. So there's been a lot of cases, uh, newspapers, corporations, where they have made a decision either to not speak out on something or to publish something that a lot of people disagreed with. And then the young employees, usually millennials and some Gen Z, say, no, you can't do that or you can't say that or we, we, we can't we have to you know have a statement against this. And it puts people in a really difficult position. And it does seem to break generationally between Gen X and millennials. Millennials. And finally, what's the most striking thing about the pollers, the generation that is following Gen Z? So, you know, pollers were the little kids during the pandemic. And that's concerning, you know, that they may have some learning deficits and things that they have to get over. But I had started the book with silence. Now, that's a generation that grew up during the Great Depression and World War II. Yet they came out on the other side pretty pretty good in terms of mental health and a lot of other indicators. So I think that may be a hopeful thing for pollers that being born into adversity doesn't necessarily doom you. It may even be a strength. Jean Twenge, the book is Generations. The real differences between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence and what they mean for America's future. Always great to see you, Jean. Thank you so much for talking with me about your book. I'm such a fan of your work and I find it so fascinating because you take like the big picture view mm -hmm. and you're able to make sense of all these things that are going on and really help analyze and synthesize them for us. So thank you, Jean, for that.